Most pastors who tell stories about themselves paint themselves to be the hero. I want to tell you one on myself that paints me to be the immature Christian who thought I was more than I was and thought I knew more than I knew. Back when I was at UT working on my business degree, Manly Beasley came to a church I attended, spoke of a Bible conference in Switzerland, said he believed that many of us in that church were supposed to go. I thought, or at least decided, that I was one of those people. The problem cost a lot of money, and I didn't have any. So I began to pray, and I began to tell people I was going. I was able to make the initial payment, but then had to trust the Lord for almost all of the cost. People would ask along the way, did you have your money? And I'd say, the Lord's taking care of it. Along the way, one college-age couple uh, came to me and said, we're going and we're trying to get the money together. But we believe God wants us to give you this money. And they did. I think it was like $300. Another college single girl came to me, said this, uh, she had actually been trying to raise money. And now she couldn't go and she gave me the money she had raised. On the Sunday night that I had to have the final amount of money, I'm walking out the church doors and Dr. George Weber, who's a breast surgeon here in Knoxville, used to be a general surgeon at Baptist, now he's down west if he's still practicing, uh, met me at the door and said, hey, Rocky, he said, uh, have you, have all, you have all your money. He and his wife are going. And I said, the Lord's taking care of it. Do you have all your money? The Lord's taking care of it. Do you have all your money? The Lord's taking care of it. He, he grabbed me and pulled me in a side room and said, both my wife and I think we're supposed to help you go. How much do you need? So they gave me a check for what I needed and, and a little bit more. And uh, so a few months later, I was at the International Congress on Revival in Switzerland. After the Congress, or after the conference, the U.S. delegation, about 100 people, as I recall, were staying in a uh, hotel in Geneva, Switzerland, flying out the next day. It was an Omni Hotel, first one I'd ever seen. People were giving testimonies about what God did in their lives at the conference. I eventually got up and told the incredible story. I gave you the short version of how I got there and then how I was surprised that God did do something incredible in my life. Manly Beasley was leading this meeting and said to me in front of all those people, do you know what your problem is, son? Sidebar, when a conversation starts with, you know what your problem is, son? It's not gonna be a fun one, okay? <laughs> this is not gonna be a fun one. Do you know what your problem is, son? Your problem is that you've not learned to be content with the conscious presence of God. You've not learned to be content with the conscious presence of God. He quoted Hebrews 3.12, Take care, brethren, that there not be any of you, in, uh, in any, of you, any one of you, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. I was humiliated. He was right. One of the best gifts I've ever been given. I want to talk to you today on the subject of when Jesus is, isn't enough. I was going to call this the danger of more. Both titles would work. When Jesus is not enough, we want and seek more. We seek something else, which is dangerous because we end up with less. Read with me in your outline, Colossians 2, 8 to 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deception, for in him, Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, he is completely God. And verse 10, in him you have been made complete. I want you to underline the words, you have been made complete. It's not something that will happen to you. It's something that has happened to you if you're a believer. And so here's what I'm going to tell you today. Jesus is who you get. Jesus is all you need. Jesus is enough. If Jesus is not enough, you don't have Jesus. So in your outline, when Jesus is not enough, we crave experiences. People crave experiences. We want to experience what we've not experienced. This started in the Garden of Eden. Think about Adam and Eve. It wasn't enough that God himself was walking in the garden communing with them. It wasn't enough that God told them that if they not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't enough that God told them that if they ate of it, they were going to die. They had to experience it for themselves. And they did. And wanting more, they ended up with much less. They then experienced separation from God, dissatisfaction with each other, and eviction from paradise. It was a bad trade-off. They had to find out to experience it for themselves. Since that time, man has wanted to experience it for himself. And if it's something that we're not supposed to experience, that just makes us want to experience it even more. 
In Romans 7, 8, Paul said, sin, taking opportunity to the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. He said, you know what? I didn't have a coveting, much of a coveting problem until I was told I wasn't supposed to covet. And then I really started coveting. In other words, because of our fallen natures, the fact that we're not supposed to do something wants to make us do it all the more. People take their first smoke because they've never experienced nicotine and want to see what it's like. People take their first drink because they've never experienced alcohol and they want to see what it's like and they want to fit in. Hardly anyone ever takes his first drink of beer and alcohol and says, man, this is great. No more Coca-Cola for me. If you were being honest, there'd be a lot more laughter. Most people thought it was awful, but they wanted to fit in, so they continued to drink. And then they drank more because they wanted to see how much it would affect them if they drank more. And they gradually acquired a taste for it. Sidebar, true story. I learned at UT that cow poop has more protein than steak. It was in a religion class, actually. It can save you a lot of money, especially out here in farmland, but you'll have to acquire a taste for it. <laughs> the upside of cow poop over alcohol is that you'll never abuse your kids, have an affair, wreck your car, endanger someone's life, or kill them because you've eaten too much cow poop. We have some policemen in our, uh, in our uh, church. They've probably gone on domestic calls, and it's probably never, they've never heard, well, Daddy had too much cow poop today. I told him not to have that last patty. But I drink in moderation. Then tell your children to do the same. Do drugs in moderation. Have sex in moderation. The Bible condemns drunkenness, but I never get drunk. So what, how does God define drunk? We think it's when we've passed out face up in our own vomit. God may define drunk as the moment in any way you're affected by drink since we are to be sober-minded. Just a thought. People take their first chew of tobacco because they want to see what they look like green and because they want to throw up. Now, that's funny right there. <laughs> if you've ever had some, you know. I had to sneak that one in. They take their first drag on a joint, swallow their first illegal pill, insert their first needle, take their first snort of Coke, not cola. They are curious about sexual matters. You get the picture. We want to experience it. There's something we haven't had, we want to have it. Something we haven't done, we want to do it. And once we start doing the more, then we need even more. The law of diminishing return sets in. We need a stronger drink, a more psychedelic drug, harder porn, a real affair. The danger of more. If someone has tasted something we haven't tasted, we want to taste it. If somebody's heard something we haven't heard, we want to hear it. If somebody's seen something we haven't seen, we want to see it. If someone has experienced something we haven't experienced, we want to experience it. You've heard the statement, curiosity killed the cat. Every addiction, every life, relationship, home, and career ruined by an addiction started with the decision to experience something that someone had not experienced, a discontent with what that person had, the need for more of something. Another problem we have is this, number two. When Jesus is not enough, whatever we have never seems to be enough. Proverbs 27, 20 says that the eyes of a man are never satisfied. Ecclesiastes 1, 8 says the eye is not satisfied with, with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. We tend to devalue what we have, devalue it, and we crave what we don't have. Once we've enjoyed our lawn, we begin to desire, desire some other greener grass. If the grass is on the other side of the fence is greener, chances are it's over a septic tank. We think that our happiness requires more money, a newer car, a bigger house, better things, a new spouse or lover, something we don't have. Some marriages fail simply because we never learn to be content with what we have and who we're with. I've seen people leave good marriages for, to, and then end up in one that isn't so good in search of more. The thing that seems most attractive to so many people is simply the next thing the thing they don't have yet. This need to experience what we haven't experienced, to have what we don't have, makes us vulnerable to some big mistakes, including spiritual mistakes. Which brings us to number three. When Jesus is not enough, 
needing more causes us to seek and accept anything that looks or feels like more. I'll say that one again. When Jesus is not enough, needing more causes us to seek and accept anything that looks or feels like more. Now, there's nothing wrong with having goals and dreams and going after them. Wanting more is not the problem. Needing more is the problem. When I need more, I'll accept whatever looks like more or feels like more. Now, let's get back to what I want to tell you today. When you got saved, first of all, Jesus is who you get. Jesus is who you get. Number one under that, Jesus is God. God is a triune being, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Under that, Jesus is I am. Jesus is God the Father. He claimed to be the great I am who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. In John 8, 52, the Jews wanted to stone him for claiming to be God when he said to them, before Abraham was, I am. In John 14, 9, Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. In John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus is, I am. Number two, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that Jesus claimed to be the Holy Spirit. And the and, uh, Bible teaches and Jesus claimed. In John 14, 16 to 17, Jesus told his disciples, I will ask the Father and he'll give you another helper and that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom, you, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus is the one who was presently with them and who at some time in the future would be in them. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us that the Holy Spirit indwells believers. In Philippians 2, 13, it says that God is the one who's at work in us. In Colossians 1, 27, it says that Christ lives in us. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And number three, salvation is having Jesus. It's having Jesus. To be a Christian is more than agreeing to some biblical truths or facts. It's more than improving your life and going to church. Being a Christian means that the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, lives in you. 1 John 5, 11 to 12 says that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Colossians 1.27 says that Christ in us is the hope of glory, the hope of us becoming who God wants us to be. It's Jesus living in us, at work in us, who enables us to become the person God made us to be, which is to become like Christ, Romans 8.29. So Jesus is I am. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Salvation's having Jesus. How do you get Jesus in you? You give yourself to him. You give your life back to the one who created it and gave it to you. You get him when he gets you. And if you get him, you get changed. If you never got changed, then you never got him. If you never got him, it's because he never got you. The way that you know you're a Christian is not because you say you are. Anyone can claim to be anything. It's not because you remember a time and a place. You went down, you cried, you got baptized, you joined the church, or any of those things. Biblically, the evidence is a changed life. God himself cannot live inside of you and it not change you. How could that happen? If he got you, then you got him. If you got him, you got changed. If you didn't get changed, you didn't get him. If you didn't get him, it's because he never got you. Being a Christian doesn't make you perfect, but a Christian cannot not change. How can God live in, live in you and it not change you and make you a different person? Not only is Jesus what you get when you get saved, Jesus is all you need. He's all you need. Whenever we discard the boundaries of Scripture, we begin to make up our own God and our own religion. Without the Bible, we're just making up God. God is, has revealed himself in his word. If you want to know God better, you have to know your Bible better. If you want to know God's will for your life, you have to know your Bible. If we read our Bible as much as our smartphones, we'd be smarter Christians. Had to throw that one in. Now, under that, number one, chaos rules when scripture is forsaken. Chaos rules when scripture is forsaken. 
Whenever we ignore the boundaries of scripture, anything goes, including holy laughter churches where the pastor is sort of a stand-up comedian who gets the people laughing and the congregation laughs themselves silly until the people are literally laying all over the floor. Where is this in the Bible? I'll tell you where it is, nowhere including people being knocked unconscious by the Holy Spirit. Where is this in the Bible? I'll tell you where it is, nowhere. Including people laying all over the floor because, quote, the glory of God is so heavy in the room. Where is this in the Bible? I'll tell you where it is, it's nowhere in the Bible. Including pastors and congregations appearing to be drunk because the Spirit has come upon them. Ephesians 5.18 pictures the spirit, being spirit-filled as the opposite of being drunk, including grave-soaking or sucking, where you put your hands on or you lay on the grave of some famous saint and absorb his or her spirit. Where is this in the Bible? Nowhere. And yet churches do it, sometimes very big churches. Is Sean Connery dead? If he is, I'm going to soak his grave to get his great voice, his good looks, and his sex appeal, okay? <laughs> I'll keep my own hair, but anyway. All of these things actually happen in churches that claim to follow Jesus in the name of God. And none of those things are anywhere in the Bible. That's a problem. Chaos rules when Scripture's forsaken. Number two, unspiritual people seek to be the greatest. They seek to be the greatest. Say, like, what's that got to do with it? Oh, you'll see. Leaders and other hungry people to look spiritual pursue experiences that will give them credibility with and power over other people. Do you remember the big problem Jesus had with his disciples? They kept trying to create a pecking order. Each of them thinking himself to be the greatest. In Luke chapter 9, verses 43 to 46, Jesus has just for the first time told the disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem and die. So what do they do? It just flew right over their head. They got into an argument about which of them was the greatest. At the Last Supper in Luke 22, when Jesus took Passover with his disciples, he just told him his body was going to be broken, his blood was going to be poured out. Their only question was, which one of us will betray you? They say, why did they ask that question? Because whoever betrayed him would go to the bottom of the pecking order. And then they again got in the same argument among themselves, which of us is the greatest? It's what unspiritual people do. They try to prop themselves, promote themselves, do something so that other people look at them and fear them, give them power, or, uh, get, or look at them in awe. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, That which has been done is that which will be done. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. What has always been is what still is. With which church is the greatest? Which preacher is the greatest? Which Christian is the greatest? I have something you don't have. I've experienced something you haven't experienced. I'm more spiritual than you because I pray a certain way, or I pray a certain amount of time, or I pray on my knees or on my face, because I have a quiet time in the morning rather than sometime later, because I raise my hands, clap, cry, or dance in worship, because I speak in tongues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't love the Lord as much as do as I do because you don't do those things. There's a Greek word. For for this baloney it's not true and anything you do to try to prop yourself up to look great spiritually you're not looking good in heaven I'm telling you you're doing just the opposite of what Jesus wants you to do and be bring us number three any genuine experience with Jesus humbles you it humbles you if your experience makes you more impressed with yourself or causes you to think that you're better than others, then it's likely that God had nothing to do with that experience. God is opposed to the proud. One of his primary goals for your life is humility. I don't know about you, but at this point in my life, when I see somebody who is spiritually full of himself, I just want to throw up. They are so impressed with themselves over something which makes me that much more unimpressed with them. 
What they think makes them impressive, in my mind, makes them unimpressive. If you have an experience with God, it is going to humble you like it did with Jacob. Another way to appear to be the greatest is to grandstand false humility. I'm the greatest because I'm the most humble. These people are proud of how humble they get. See the hypocrisy and the irony? Jesus is what you get. Jesus is all you need. Number three, Jesus is enough. He's enough. Under that, when Jesus, number one, when Jesus is not enough, people misuse and misinterpret the Bible to impress and to control others. When Jesus is not enough, people misuse and misinterpret the Bible to impress and control others. Some people misuse biblical words and principles such as the word anointing to try to claim their spot near the top of the Christian pecking order and to gain power and control over people who don't know any better. Someone thinks he or she claims to have a special anointing. 2 Corinthians 1.21 and John 2.20 and 27 teach that every believer has an anointing because every believer has the Holy Spirit. Now listen closely. If someone tells you they have an anointing, you tell them you have one of those too. I don't care who you are, that right there is funny. <laughs> They're all proud of themselves. Well, I have an anointing. Well, so do I. I'm a Christian. Every Christian has an anointing. It's never used of somebody having this power or something special that somebody else doesn't have that they need and need to experience so they can be as, as spiritual as the person on the top of the pecking order. These insecure people misuse biblical words or principles to give them power over naive people who don't know God or don't know his word well. Things get hyped, spiritualized, a better word is mysticized as much as possible. This feeds a person's brokenness and the need to fill the void in his or her life with an experience or a feeling that's not being filled with Jesus. There's a demon behind every problem that needs to be cast out. I apparently have the demon of loving Jap Masaki's Japanese Steakhouse. If you've got the gift, I beg of you, please don't cast it out. Okay? <laughs> The demon of nicotine, the demon of alcohol, the demon of porn, the demon of whatever. Spiritualize everything. Hype everything. We're going to change the whole world. Can I tell you something? You're not. The world's going to hell. Have you read your Bible? And sometimes in churches we make these false, uh, we give people these false hopes about God. That's what the somebody told me so God was about. And then we, give the, we try to build this, cre high, this great hype so everybody be excited about the hype. We're a movement. We're a this. We're a that. Wow. Can I tell you something? If you're walking with Jesus, you don't need a movement. You don't need a wow. You don't need an experience because you know him. Amen. You know him. Number two. When Jesus is not enough, some people deliberately deceive and manipulate others. In the outside of biblical boundaries world, there's also a history of lies, manipulation, and fake miracles. Jim Jones faked his own death and resurrection. Grant remembers a 2020 program years ago where a church used a small battery in the baptistry so that those baptized would think they were feeling the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Diane Sawyer later exposed a bunch of deceptive multi-millionaire preachers who staged and faked miracles to attract crowds, impress people, and especially to take their money. And people by the droves, by the thousands... Line up for their crusades and send them checks. I know of a guy on the radio who recently got in big trouble for it because he misused a million unneeded dollars in his fund that was supposed to be funding radio and television. He had a million dollars excess he could do something else with. He's in trouble now for it too. People line up a million deep to write him a big check. You ought to support your church because you know what's going on at your church. And you know your pastors, they're not perfect, I'm sure not, but you know them. Sadly, everybody's hero is somebody they don't know anything about. 
Who's your hero? I guarantee you, it's, it's somebody, your spiritual hero is somebody you don't know anything about except how good they can look on stage. And every year, there's another one that goes down that somebody thought was the greatest. Have you ever seen a hypnotism? There are people who can be hypnotized, and there are those who seemingly won't fall for it. At the fair here in Knoxville several years ago, there was this big old boy who got hypnotized and believed that his rear end was on fire. Every time they played the music, Johnny Cash's song, I fell into a burning ring of fire. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. This is a great big old country boy. And it's the moment that music started, his feet went up and his rear end hit that ground and he scooted his tail across that ground trying to put that fire out. Like the strange video, fire video I asked you to watch, you wouldn't believe it unless you saw it. Psychiatrist and former UT med school teacher Robert Davidson told me about how people can work themselves into self-hypnosis. I watched a video last night and somebody was going through something and before it ever happened to them, they were already gone. They had worked themselves into an emotional mental lather and they were sitting duck for anything that would happen to them. You could hypnotize yourself into an experience. He told the little girl who had a hangnail, and he, he drew on the board what, how you fix that. And this little girl, as he was talking to her, he realized she was kind of wandering off. He said, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to the park to play. He said, you just go on. He used no medication, sliced her toe, did this surgery, and put, her, put a bandage on it, and she walked out of there. Never had the first pain med. She self-hypnotized herself. I guess that's redundant, isn't it? Paranoia is real, but it's not based upon the truth. So you know somebody who's paranoid. That's as real to them as the chair you're sitting in. But it's not based on truth. Mentally ill people can think that they're Jesus, the Messiah, or a prophet. There's all kinds of those. And they, it's as real to them as the chair you're sitting on. But it isn't true. Every experience is real, but not every experience is true. And if you have to have more, you'll accept anything that looks or feels like more. Number three, when Jesus is not enough, people substitute experiences for a relationship with God. Now, I want you to listen real closely. The need for more, the substituting of feelings and experiences for a relationship with God causes people to seek post-salvation experiences. Now, let me just stop right here. How many of you would like to know what the Bible has to say about this? Anybody here like to know what the Bible has to say about this? I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you what somebody has experienced and think they believe because they had an experience. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Now, I don't want you to believe it because I'm saying it. I want you to go look at your own Bible and see if it's true. You don't ever buy anything just because I say it, and you sure don't buy anything because somebody else says it. I'm not, the Bible's not validated by me. I'm validated by it. Does that make sense? So they buy into getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. The concept is mentioned in John the Baptist, by John the Baptist in Matthew 3.11 and Luke 3.16 in reference to what took place at Pentecost. Jesus never talked about it, nor does any other place in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? Now think with me. Jesus claimed that he would rise from the dead. How would they know? Because they saw him alive and touched him. Jesus claimed that he would come to indwell them by his Holy Spirit. Well, how were they going to know that? He gave them a sign. The Holy Spirit came in a visible manner, appearing as tongues of fire at Pentecost. This only happened one time. The Spirit came to indwell others in observable ways in two other occasions, in book, both in Acts. But there were no tongues of fire. It wasn't called a baptism, and it was separate from water baptism. And it's not called a baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts only by John the Baptist. Never mentioned about by Jesus. At Pentecost, the disciples spoke in what the Bible refers to as tongues. These tongues were not unintelligible ecstatic utterances. These believers shared the gospel with people in languages they had never learned according to Acts 2, 6-11. On two other occasions in Acts, people received the Holy Spirit. There were no tongues of fire, but they did speak in tongues. In Acts 10, lost men were saved and received the Holy Spirit as Peter spoke to them. 
These Gentiles spoke in tongues. In Acts 19, Paul found some people who knew of John the Baptist. And he had taught them that Jesus was coming. But these Ephesians didn't even know that Jesus had even come yet. And not that he had died and been raised, he was now back in heaven. Paul brought them up to speed, baptized in the name of Jesus, laid hands on them, and they spoke in tongues. In Peter's case, he was just speaking and it happened. Neither of these cases involved being baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. That was a one-time event at Pentecost. God used the sign of tongues to unite the church. How else would he get these former Jews, now Christians, who hated Gentiles who were now becoming Christians, to unite and be one church? He would do it through this, this gift a couple of times in the book of Acts. In Acts 10, verse 47, Peter verbalized this by saying, Surely no one can refuse water for these, these Gentiles, to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? He tells us exactly why they got it that way. Because there's no way the Jews were going to accept these Gentiles without it. Now, a couple things you need to know. The ability of men to work miracles does not run throughout the Bible. It only happened in three waves. The first wave was Moses, who represents the law. If you remember, he had a rod, and he worked all these miracles and devastated uh, Egypt. He split the Red Sea. He brought uh, water from a rock. He had miracles in his hand, is what I call it. And then Elijah comes along. Elijah represents the prophets, and he and his protege, Elisha, they worked miracles. They raised some, both of them raised somebody from the dead. They did some incredible things like that. None of the other prophets did any miracles. It wasn't something that every prophet did. Every leader of Israel did. No one leader of Israel did. Two prophets did. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, the heads of those. When Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration in John 17, who appeared with him? Anybody remember? Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the first two waves. And then Jesus worked miracles. They proved that he was who he claimed to be. In John 10, 37, 38, Jesus said, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in him. And then the apostles did miracles. Acts 5 makes it clear that Peter was healing people and Paul did miraculous things. But all of that changed over time. Now listen real closely. And if you're going to follow the Bible, what I'm about to say has to have a huge weight in whatever you decide you're going to believe. Eventually, all that changed over time. Eventually, Paul couldn't heal his own thorn in the flesh. And then in the last book he ever wrote, he mentioned leaving a friend sick in Miletus. Why? Because he couldn't heal him. Apparently, what he could do earlier, he couldn't do now. What Peter did earlier, nothing else has ever said about him healing anybody else. Isn't that strange? If the church ought to be about healing and miracles, why isn't the, why isn't the epistles full of stories about them? I want to show you that the epistles are basically void of any reference to them. The first church did not have the Old Testament or the New Testament in their hands. There were no... But, excuse me, bound books, only scrolls. Most of them were in the synagogues. So all the Old Testament scrolls basically were in the synagogues. We know that God spoke in those days to people like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Well, some of you are paying attention. All right, not Mary, James, the brother of Jesus. Because they all penned books in the Bible. We know God spoke to them. God apparently in the early days of the church spoke to the church through prophecies, through what was called, quote, words of knowledge, and through tongues where one person spoke without knowing what he was saying and another person who understood the language and interpreted it without ever learning that language. That happened. There's some instances of that happening. Pentecost being the one where the, the, the people from out of town said, what's happened? We're hearing these people tell us about God in, in our own language, which they knew they hadn't learned. Now, here's the million, million dollar question. Did, you, did God choose to continue to speak in those ways? Once the writings of the New Testament started becoming available, did God need to speak to the church in those ways? A few interesting facts. 
The only epistle in the New Testament to mention tongues and miraculous gifts is 1 Corinthians. It's the only one. There are 19 other epistles that never mention tongues or miraculous gifts. Not at all, zero, zilch, including 2 Timothy. Isn't that interesting? First and second Timothy are about what to do in the church. Why the complete absence of those things? And by the way, most of those books were written after 1 Corinthians. It's also worthy to note, and if you read the Charismatics book by uh, MacArthur, that in Corinth there were pagan religions who spoke in, in ecstatic utterances. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says this. If there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Now in the Greek verbs, something will be done to end prophecy and knowledge. Say, so what's knowledge? It's obviously referring to the word of knowledge, which was mentioned in the, pra the chapter prior to this, 1 Corinthians 12. Only time it's ever mentioned in Scripture. And so here he says, something will be done to bring an end to those things. People will no longer tell the future. We don't need it. We've got revelation telling us the future. We've got the words of Jesus in the Gospels telling us what would happen in the future. We don't need a prophet to tell us that now. The words of knowledge. We don't need the word of knowledge. Why? Because we've got the word of God in our hands. And then it says, uh, the, verb trans then the verb translated cease is a different verb, a different voice. It means that the tongues would literally cease themselves or stop by themselves. Now, if you read any honest commentary, that's what's going to tell you. So the big question begs to be asked, when did all of these three gifts end or have they? There's no need for prophecy or words of knowledge, words from the Lord. I got a word from the Lord because we have God's words in our hands. There's no longer a need for a sign to identify or unite believers. Missionaries now have access to learning languages and share the gospel all around the world. Those things being done away or ceasing at some time in the future makes no sense at all. Those things having been done away with and and ceasing in the first century, demonstrated by their complete absence of mention in 19 other epistles, makes lots of sense. And then there are people in churches who begin to assume that they have the franchise on the Holy Spirit. Where is it written? It is not. Whatever God wants you to have, you can have it if you'll just walk with him. God has not handed over what only he can do to any person or church. You don't need a mediator who thinks he's greater than you because he thinks he has something you don't have to be God's agent to you. That's the whole point of the veil being torn when Christ was crucified. Remember the veil was split in half in the temple? Why? Because man can now go right to God. You don't have to have some church do something for you you can't get from God without it or some man to do something for you or woman that you can't get from God without it. You can go straight to God. You're no longer at the mercy of a priest or a mediator or anybody who thinks he or she is anointed. Every experience is real, but not every experience is true. We don't interpret the Bible by our subjective experiences. We interpret our subjective experiences by an objective, tried and true word of God. If you want to clap, that'd be a good time to do it right there. And if you don't understand that, you're a sitting duck for the devil to deceive you in any way he decides to. Because once you leave the boundaries of Scripture, anything goes. And if it feels good and you were talking some Jesus talk when it happened, you'll think it was a God thing. Jeremiah 7, 9 says that the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We are all easily deceived because we are all masters at deceiving ourselves. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us that we had better be sober-minded and alert because Satan is a roaring lion who's prowling about seeking to devour us. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11.13-15. Such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, no wonder, 
For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Now, Jesus called them sheep in wolves' clothing. If you got Jesus, you got all you need. You are complete in him if the Bible is true, and I think it's true. You don't need a second blessing or a baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, you got Jesus, which means you got his spirit. And you didn't get a pint or a quart. You got all of him. We don't get more of God once we've been saved, but we, he does need to continue to get more of us. Here's the last thing. If Jesus is not enough, let's listen closely, you probably don't have Jesus. If Jesus is not enough, you probably don't have Jesus. So prove that. Thank you, I will. Jesus is all you need. At salvation, Jesus is what you get. And Jesus is enough. The Bible says so. You're complete in him. If Jesus is not enough, then you probably don't have Jesus. The need for more is an admission of personal and spiritual emptiness. Rather than looking for a feeling or an experience, which will leave you looking for a better feeling and a greater experience, why don't you try a relationship with a person, Jesus? 1 John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life. Not that you feel something, feel a certain way, or even feel someone, God's presence. Not that you have experiences or that you have some gift. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, and your Son, Jesus, whom you have sent. And let me leave you with the most sobering verses in the entire Bible. These are the words of Jesus himself. These words are not about atheists, agnostics, or people who never darken the doors of churches. These verses are about people who are deeply entrenched in the church. These verses are about people who make claims of the supernatural and miraculous. These verses are about people who claim to be prophets, who claim to cast out demons, and who claim to do many miracles. These are the people who have substituted experiences for a relationship with God. Again, these are the words of Jesus himself, and I'm under the assumption that any, any, if anybody knows what he's talking about, it's Jesus. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, read it there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter Many, underline that word, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Again, we're talking about what we as Baptists believe to be an inspired, inerrant word of God. It's exactly what God said to us. These are the very words of Jesus himself. Why didn't he just say that many who went to church often or did great things? No. He specifically mentioned three specific miraculous things. If this is true, and it is, then, where are, then there are people who call themselves prophets who don't even know or really follow Jesus. There are people who claim to cast out demons who don't even know or really follow Jesus. And there are those that gullible people are thinking uh, they're doing miracles who don't even know and aren't really following Jesus. Now, we'll stop right here. If you've got a problem with what I just said, your problem is not with me. Your problem is with Jesus. He's the one who said it. He's the one that picked out these three items to throw in there. These people who seem to know all about God don't even know God. These people who seem to be the greatest Christians turned out not to be Christians at all. These people who seem to have so much more had less. Again, Jesus said there were many. Few on the way to heaven, go back in the, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, actually in that chapter, few on the way to heaven, many on, the, on Broadway to destruction. Same word, many here. These people may talk Jesus talk better than you. 
They may obviously seem to be committed to the Lord and do a lot of good things. They may seem to be some of the best people you know. These are not spiritual bystanders. They are neck deep in ministry. A person is not right because he seems to be good to you, good, and because you like him or her. I remember years ago, we, there was a big controversy when the Southern Baptist Convention had kind of started to go liberal and people were fighting against it and, and won. I remember having a conversation. There was a pastor here in town, a guy at, at a seminary in Kentucky had written a book. And in that book, he said, Jesus sinned. Okay. I mean, that's, that's about the greatest error you could ever say. If Jesus sinned, he's not God. If he's not God, he can't save us. And it's all a bunch of bull. And yet this professor said Jesus sinned. And I heard a pastor, a Knoxville pastor say, but I know him and he's a good guy. How good a guy a person is has nothing to do with whether or not his doctoral position is biblical. Has nothing to do with that. A person's not right because he seems to be good and you like, like him or her. A thing is not biblical because someone who seems to be good embraces it. It's biblical because it's biblical no matter who or who does not embrace it. These verses indicate that this will be a shock to everyone, especially the people who think that they prophesied, cast out demons, and did many miracles. Some of them are deliberate con men. Probably most of them are just deceived. They were seduced by the need for emotions, the need for experiences, the need for apparent results, the need for more. And not finding enough because they did not have Jesus, they sought more and ended up with less. Do you know and walk with a person with Jesus? Can I tell you about a relationship? You have a relationship with God. How many of you, don't raise your hand, okay? How many of you are married and say, relationships are pretty boring? They really are. You know, relationships aren't, aren't always the uh, you know, mountaintop experiences and wonderful, lovely, motion-filled uh, dinners or whatever else. No, relationships are taking out the garbage and changing the oil and mowing the yard and changing the baby's diaper. Most of the things you do in any relationship is quite mundane. It's not wowsy. It's not spectacular. And what we have with God is the relationship, not Disneyland. Listen, he's not an amusement park. He doesn't exist to amuse us or give us great feelings every day. Do you know and walk with a person with Jesus? If Jesus really has you, then you have him. If you have him, then you have enough. You are complete in him. You don't need a second blessing, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, a miraculous gift. You just need to spend more time in your Bible and with your Lord, getting to know him and giving more of yourself to him. If Jesus isn't enough, nothing else will be. If you don't really have Jesus, then what you have isn't enough. This is true for people who are outside of and inside of the walls of the church. If you require Jesus to do something miraculous, then it's evidence that you don't really know him. He doesn't have to prove himself to you when he lives in you. If you require post-salvation experiences, then you probably have never met the one who is enough and who makes you complete. If Jesus isn't enough to you, then you probably don't have Jesus. Jesus. 